Some years ago now, in the United Methodist Church, there was a movement afoot called Quest for Quality. Makes sense? During that time, there was one particular United Methodist bishop who spoke to the pastors and la several lay leaders from each of the churches in his conference. The meeting was about a new paradigm for the church. The bishop said the old paradigm is that we focus on problems. If we don't have enough money, that's a problem, and so we focus on stewardship. If we don't have enough people, then we focus on membership drives. But the bishop said the new paradigm is to make sure that the main thing is the main thing. So what is the main thing? I believe, as did that bishop, that the main thing for the church is spiritual growth. Spiritual growth of ourselves and others, nurturing those in need and spending time reading the Bible for our spiritual growth. Now, I want you to know that I believe strongly in the work of the visioning that we did together, and I wholeheartedly support those goals that were developed at the same time, I agree with that bishop that the main thing is not focusing on numbers, whether that's related to money or to membership. And the main thing is not holding committee meetings. I don't know if you can say that as a Methodist pastor. <laughs> and even then, I hate to say this, the main thing is not worrying about justice. All of these are important. Do not hear me say that they are not. All of these are very important. But if we as the church take care of the main thing, feeding people spiritually, growing in our spiritual life, what Paul calls in today's reading the prize of the heavenly call of God in Jesus Christ, then we will be able to and prepared to take care of all the rest. It's out of that belief that we have decided to do something different here this year at the Church on the Cape in terms of our financial stewardship as a church. We've decided to begin with an attitude of gratitude. As it says in our theme statement for this month, which you see in your bulletin, to focus on gratitude as an important part of the biblical understanding of Christian stewardship, rather than focusing on the need of the church to receive our money. Last week I read to you a story from the book The Gratitude Path by Kent Millard, a story about his son. Let me share with you something else that Dr. Millard says in that book. The followers of Jesus are simply people who live with an attitude to gratitude. We come to worship simply to say thanks to God for all the blessings God has first given us. We give our time, talent, and treasure to God not out of obligation or out of guilt, but simply to say thank you. Often when we talk about stewardship and tithing, it sounds like a heavy obligation. And we make people feel guilty if they don't tithe their income to God. We give to God from our depth of gratitude to God, not because someone makes us feel guilty if we don't give. See how much gratitude is in your heart, and then decide how much of your time, talent, and treasure you will return to God. He goes on to say, my image for giving is that giving is circular. We receive gifts from God, and we give back to God. And then we receive again, and we give again. It's the cycle that brings meaning and joy into our lives. In a similar way, we all receive the gift of life from God, and we share our lives with others, and then life returns to us, and we share it again. As we share with one another, that also is the cycle of life. If we receive gifts from God and refuse to share them, or just hold them ourselves, we die spiritually. Think about it this way for a moment. Is your glass half empty or half full? Are you focused on what you don't have, focused on your problems and wanting to keep a tight hold on all that you do have for fear of losing it? Or are you counting your blessings, grateful for all that you do have, and wanting to be generous in expressing that gratitude to God? Or are you, like most of us, a little of each? God has blessed us all, and we are full to overflowing with blessings. May we all count our blessings and see what God has already done in our lives. And then out of a deep heart of gratitude, we will joyfully give 
some of our time and talent and treasure back to God just to say thanks. I need to pause a moment, sorry. It's water, I promise you. <clears throat> My friends, we have so much to be thankful for. I read this recently, the average yearly income worldwide based on 2016 figures for gross national income divided by the population of each country for 88 countries ranges from $186,080 per capita in Monaco to $400 a year in Madagascar, $400 a year. The U.S. is in ninth place from the top <coughs> with an average per capita yearly income of $56,180 per capita. The country ninth from the bottom is Ghana with an average yearly income of only $1,380. Do we have any idea how fortunate we are? Do you know there's nothing in us or in this universe that says that God must be gracious and merciful to us or that God's love must be everlasting? So why? Does God love? There's only one right answer. God loves because it is God's nature to love. Because God is love. There's a Dennis the Menace cartoon which shows Dennis and Joey leaving the Wilson's front porch each with a handful of cookies. Joey has this surprised look on his face and Dennis says this, Mrs. Wilson gives us cookies not because we're nice, but because she's nice. <laughs> So it's not because we deserve it, but simply out of God's perfect nature of love that God is always generous to God's children. This is what I think of when I think of our firefighters and our EMTs and other first responders. You sacrifice for the greater good of others. Often people do not even know what you do. Out of a sense of being part of a community, a larger family, that kind of generosity is not often recognized, so today we all want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Let me take a moment and do that. God calls each one of us to be just as generous in our response to the unconditional love that we have received. You see, it's not what we have done, but what's been done for us through Christ. It's not our love for God that makes us generous. It's knowing that God loves us in spite of everything. Whatever horrible things we think we have done, God loves us. We love God because God loves us. And our generosity is motivated by that reciprocal love. For God. That love from God and for God is the heart of compassion. For this second week of our theme of Attitude of Gratitude, we have an image of a community of compassion, caring and sharing God's love in the world. From the early Hebrew practice of leaving the gleanings of the harvest in the field for the poor to gather, to Jesus' commission in the New Testament to care for the least of these. Compassion is the true measure of our stewardship as the community of faith. And so the scripture asks us, is your heart tender and compassionate? The word compassion literally means to suffer together. The meaning of compassion is first to recognize the suffering of others and then to take action to help. Two steps to recognize and empathize and relate to that suffering and then to do something to make a difference. I read this story about compassion which was written by Gary Melville, who's the Director of Development for the United Methodist Foundation of New England. Each month he writes an inspirational message and I am often touched to the core by what he says. This one is called, We Are Quilt Makers. He says, last month I attended a planned giving conference. That sounds exciting. One of the speakers was Eddie Thompson, a consultant and grandfather. He described the work we do in development through a personal story. It begins with a phone call. You know that one that every parent and grandparent dreads. 
His son calls and can only say the name of the hospital and the room number. When Eddie and his wife arrive, the doctor explains that their three-year-old grandson, Ethan, is dying. Eddie recounted how he held his grandson's hand as the family joined hands in prayer around the hospital bed. Heartbreaking, throat choking. After Ethan died, the nurses removed the IVs and the other equipment. They brought in a basin and towels and let mom give Ethan a bath one last time. The Women's Guild of the hospital makes comfort quilts, prayer quilts for patients. They wrapped Ethan in a beautiful quilt. He was buried with that quilt. Ethan's dad carried the coffin by himself into the church and to the open grave. He told Eddie it was the last thing he could do for his son. Eddie recounted how they created a fund in Ethan's name at the hospital to help parents who have lost a child. He said, that was three years ago. Each year on September 12th, they bring a check and touch the bronze nameplate. Eddie reflected on that quilt. Whoever made it so did so with talent and artistry and love. That quilt wrapped not just Ethan, but that family in love when they needed it most. Eddie said, we are called to be quilt makers. Gary added that this was an interesting message to a room full of mostly secular fundraising professionals. But he went on to say, behind every gift there is a motivation and a story. There are lots of ways to be quilt makers, but they all have the same pattern, the pattern of love. Love and compassion. Love and compassion. That's what leads us to generosity. An attitude of gratitude leads us to generosity. I'm going to finish the rest of today's message talking about the biblical understanding of generosity. The biblical method resolves around a wonderful word that I talked about with the children, a word that begins with T and sounds like a lisp. What is it? <laughs> Thank you. Not a Methodist or a Catholic or a Baptist word, a biblical word. To tithe means that out of gratitude to God, I give a percentage off the top of my earnings. Tithing declares that it's a priority of my life because it's the first claim on my paycheck, even before I pay my student loans or the phone bill or my kids' student loans. Tithing is an act of obedience. The Bible clearly directs me to do it. The biblical guideline for the tithe is 10%. In reality, giving in United Methodist congregations, as well as most other mainline Protestant congregations, is far less than 10% of people's incomes. According to studies, average giving by church members is between 2 and 2.5% 2 of members' annual income. Years ago, the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee, was approached by a man wanting him to help figure exactly what a tithe of his income should be. That pastor said wisely, Mr. Anderson, I am not interested in helping you figure out what your tithe is. Every time you figure, God loses. Excuse me, I have something more important to do. The man left, but the seeming rebuff kept eating at him. Finally, he came back and told the pastor how he felt. I knew you'd come, Brother Anderson, said the pastor. I wanted to tell you that it's not Jim Anderson's tithe that, that God wants. God wants Jim Anderson. God wants you to give yourself. God wants you to give yourself in the Sunday service and the Bible study. God wants you to give yourself through the Sunday school class that the superintendent has been asking you to take. God wants you to give of yourself, Brother Anderson. And when you give yourself, then you will have no trouble figuring your tithe. The outcome of the story is that this man and his wife did give their lives to devoted Christian service. And for many years, they gave more than half of their income. Thank you to Bobby for five of those ten dollars. <laughs> when my late father was a leader in his church, he used to become involved in the door-to-door -door campaigns, visitations for the annual stewardship drive, door-to-door -door in Orono, Maine. He became concerned about one elderly woman who had no income other than her social security check, and yet she gave ten percent of that check to the church each month right off the top. 
He said something like this to her, my dear friend, I know you are hard pressed financially. If you feel that tithing is too much for your budget to stand, that will be all right. The church will be okay. The church will understand. This lady fixed my father, who was a big, impressive man, with a disapproving look. <laughs> and she said, when I consider all that God has done for me, the very least I can do is to give 10% back to him. How I wish I could give more, but I'm certainly not going to keep what belongs to him. I happen to have my monthly check ready to send to the church, but if you don't want to deliver it, I'll find someone who will. <laughs> After that, my dad never suggested to another person that they keep part of the tithe for themselves. So why the tithe? The Bible doesn't say that the primary tithing, purpose of tithing is to support the church. Rather, the primary beneficiary of tithing is the individual who is doing the tithing. The gift of tithing is that it keeps us on track as growing disciples. Maxie Dunham says that tithing to the church enhances our performance in the cause of God's <coughs> kingdom. He goes on to say, now if that sounds lofty, enhancing our performance in the cause of God's kingdom, it really isn't so lofty. It's the most down-to-earth practical thing I know. There are some things that you and I can never do for Christ and his kingdom by his, ourselves, he says. We have to be a part of a body, a community, and this is especially true in our use of money. I believe this is primarily the reason that we're to bring all our tithes into the storehouse, into the church. The church can use that cumulative money to accomplish far greater things than we could ever accomplish on our own. Bob and I started tithing over 26 years ago when we were first married. Giving that tithe first, off the top, forces us to flex our faith muscles with the other 90%. We have to believe that with God's help, the remaining 90% of our income can meet our family's needs. And at that time, there were five kids running around that we had to worry about. But God is faithful. We know that God has had a hand in our finances all through the years. Just as surely as a financial need would arise that we had no way to cover, God revealed a way. God has done it so many times that we don't even feel surprised anymore when it happens. So remember what that bishop said years ago. Our job is to make sure that the main thing is the main thing. As we get our spiritual house in order, the rest will fall into place. Thanks be to God. <laughs>